everyone. Happy Saturday. And thank you so much uh, for coming to spend a little bit of time with myself and Darlana. Yeah. I am so grateful for you to be here today, Darlana. I am just such an admirer of the incredible work that you do. So thank you for being here today. And for everybody that's here in the audience, Tea Talks is just an opportunity to have conversations with people in the riding. I think it's really important to look at the amazing work that's being done right here in our backyard. And I'm so grateful to have so many amazing people that I get to um, work with and listen to and learn from. So I'm going to do a quick introduction of you. So Darlana was born and raised in Powell River, BC. She is the mother of three children and sadly lost her oldest son, Sean Robert Trelor, Trelor, sorry, to fentanyl poisoning in 2016. He struggled with addiction for close to 10 years. After Darlana and all of his loved ones lost him to addiction, she went on a search to learn more about what herself and her family had gone through. After searching on the internet, Darlana found Mom Stop the Harm, a network of Canadian families impacted by substance use, the harms and deaths, along with Darlana. This group of advocates worked to change the failed drug policies and to provide peer support for grieving families and those who uh, loved ones are currently using. Mom's Starp the Harm helped Darlana greatly, and I think really continues to, in the loss of her son through that connection and support, and now she is returning that by helping others who are struggling through this now. And that's really why I have you here, Darlana. I think the work that you do with Mom Stop the Harm is absolutely uh, inspiring. And what I really appreciate is how you just don't stop. I, I just, you know, <laughs> through the last year of the pandemic, I've watched you just keep doing the work in social distance way. It doesn't matter. The passion in you to just keep doing this work is so important. So my first question to you is, can you tell me a bit about your work with Mom Stop the Harm, and what impacts does it have? Okay, um, so I might repeat a little bit of what you said, but uh, I joined Mom Stop the Harm not long after I lost my son to fentanyl poisoning here in Powell River in 2016. And it was one of the best and most important things I could have done to help myself. Um, Mom Stop the Harm is a network of Canadian families who advocate for harm reduction, decriminalization, for personal use and safe supply, as well as providing peer support to other grieving families and support to families with loved ones who use. To be able to connect with others and talk about what we have all gone through is very helpful in this journey. There is no judgment as we have all been there and share the same heartache. We also offer education and resources through our website when I lost my son in 2016, I needed to learn more about what our family had gone through. And I'm very grateful to be able to have found Mom Stop the Harm. I remember when I went to the police station to pick up my son's things. And as I was speaking to the officer, he informed me that there was lots of fentanyl here. Sorry, here I go. In 2016. Okay. So the words out of my mouth at that moment were, why doesn't anybody know? You know, why don't we know? So he had a look of shock on his face when I said that, but that's when I started talking from that day forward. And I'll tell you, it was really hard to step forward in our small town because back then no one was talking and shame and stigma was rife, kind of still is. But I know, I, ha I knew I had to warn others about the toxic drugs in our town. So I also want to thank Mom Stop the Harm for helping me have the strength to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate what you're saying. And I think, you know, that is the fight. It is this stigma that hides these stories because people don't want to tarnish the love and reputation of their, their loved one when they go. And that is devastating because it doesn't allow us to know. And I know for myself, I've been told by many health professionals everywhere in our riding that some of the people that are dying in our community their families never say anything about how they died because they feel they're, bad they're, they feel ashamed they feel ashamed and, they're embarrassed and they're sad and it's it's painful yeah it's and painful they're alone about it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And then it leaves everybody alone. And and I'll never forget, I know going off side track a little bit here, but I remember having paramedics uh, about two years ago coming to see me in Ottawa and they were talking about that app that they've created now, mm -hmm. where if you're using, you push the button on the app you use, and then you have to stop it. And if you don't stop it, that's uh, alerts the paramedics to come in and check on you. And I just thought, what a world we live in now, that this is a tool that we have to use to try to keep people alive. But it's so necessary. I'm it so is. glad for this app. Yeah. yeah. So COVID has impacted all of us. And I keep talking about COVID because I, I think it's important to recognize the impact that it's had on so many facets of our life. But it has impacted the way that we gather. And I know that that has impacted some of the work that you do. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about how you found creative ways to make sure you were heard and you were able to help even in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, it uh, definitely has impacted the way we, we advocate, but we're still managing to get our word out. Um, most of our meetings are done by Zoom. Uh, support groups are either held by Zoom or limit to 10 people in-house following the COVID rules. Um, most recently, we did a demonstration here in Powell River in front of our hospital for National Day of Action. And there were 10 of us uh, with signage calling for an end to the deaths, deaths, asking the government to please do something. We went live on Facebook asking for safe supply, so we were able to make an impact and reach people. Five years ago, our provincial government declared a public health emergency on the overdose crisis. And we have lost thousands more of our young people since then. And we're asking, where is the emergency response? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I know in our office, we took the naloxone training. And I've really reflected on that uh, during COVID because people, how to do that during a pandemic is, is even harder. So I just, I worry about a lot of the folks that are struggling every day and not being able to get access to those services. So, you know, another thing that I know is that you've worked really hard with the Powell River Mayor and Council, and you've asked the federal government to step up. And I think that's really important because in my opinion, there's definitely been some resources, but like you said, the numbers are still incredibly high and we're not seeing it peak and then go down. It just keeps peaking higher and higher. The numbers are startling. Yeah. I'm just wondering, what are you and the mayor and the council calling for? Well, we asked the mayor and council to write a letter to the federal government asking for safe regulated supply and decriminalization of the possession of drugs for personal use. We are asking that this is treated like the health emergency that it is. And in the long run, this is gonna save money by reducing prison and jail costs and population size. It will free up law enforcement resources to be used in more appropriate ways. It will priority, prioritize health and safety over punishment for people who use drugs. And it will reduce stigma associated with drug use. So people who use will want to seek treatment and other supports. I would like to see the proper health uh, addressing mental health calls rather than the police coming to deal with these types of calls. I would like to see mental health professionals take on this role. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's something we've heard a lot about is that that is a huge part of the gap. And I, I think this is really important. Because when people hear decriminalization of personal possession, I've heard people say to me, well, does that mean that people that are out there dealing will just get away with it? And I've tried to make it really clear that this is about people who have enough to use for themselves mm -hmm. and that the issue for them is addiction. It, it's a mental health issue. And if we just keep putting them in the legal system, we never get to the other side of this. Exactly. And so I'm just wondering if you could speak to that and, and why, when you say exactly, what do you think is the significant difference? Um, <laughs> okay, now, now you've got me again. Um, <laughs> I went off script. You went off script. Um, yeah. Um, well, for people who are struggling, I, it will help them to feel like they're cared about. Um, they'll be able to seek treatment and help easy, more easily. They'll, uh, they'll come forward. Yeah. 
Well, I really agree with you. And I think that's the point that is something I hope we all listen to is that people are feeling alone and families are feeling alone. We yeah. know when we have a loved one with an addiction and we're doing our best and the court system is is not the solution. And And it may take a while for people to sober up, but that I think that caring voice on the other end leads a lot more uh, to those opportunities than just going through a system that they that they just don't get any acknowledgement for the addiction that they're facing. So yeah. I appreciate that. Sorry to go off screen. <laughs> <laughs> so in BC, uh, we have lost 1,716 people in 2020 due to overdose. Um, I believe this is a public health emergency. And I, I want to be clear, a crisis is, is something that we should be concerned about. An emergency means we need resources to deal with it. And uh, the federal government has still not called this an emergency. And I think that's hopefully a really important factor that people remember. What help do we need to help stop this overdose emergency? There's a lot of things that we need. It, it really is a big picture and it goes in many directions. So we need detox with rapid access to treatment afterwards and support. We need more help for mental health and addiction. We need education, prevention, drug policy change. And again, we need a safe regulated supply in order to curb the black market and stop people from dying because of toxic drugs. Um, people are being poisoned. People use drugs, lots of people. Why is it okay that they should die because of substance use? It's not okay that I, that I and thousands of other families, sorry, here I go, mm -hmm. have lost their loved ones like this. Mm -hmm. The pain of our loss is indescribable. Just look at all these young people behind me. My son was a teenager when he got addicted. He got addicted to prescription pills. And we're going, to, going back around 2008, and this is when the doctors were told by pharmacy companies that oxys were safe. The pills were being overprescribed, which contributed to the selling of pills and the addiction crisis. When my son came to me for help with his addiction, he was young and he was scared. We took him to the doctor, we took him to our family doctor, and he was put on a weaning program at that time, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. the drugs he had been taking were strong and when his dose went down he would beg me for more he ended up going to the street for what he needed so the next time we went to the doctor I told the doc what it, what he had done and the doctor closed his computer and told us we were on our own I didn't know how to help my son and so he ended up going to the methadone doctor by himself and while he he and while I was sad that he was on the never ending methadone program, I was thankful because I thought he was going to be safe. Mm -hmm. I wish Sean was here to see what's happening now. I know he would want to take part in all of this that we're doing and it would give him a feeling of hope. And he loved to help people too. And Sean had a big caring heart. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And I think, uh, I mean, I appreciate, I, I love the picture in the back. I mean, it makes me really sad to see all those faces, You're young. but I, I'm also really happy that we see all those faces because we think they're just gone. We don't think that they are people who did good things in the world that were well loved by people around them and that their death has been devastating to a whole lot of other people. And it's because, you know, I just shared on my Facebook page the other day, um, Island Health was saying, you know, watch out, there's a higher level of, of toxic drugs out there right now. And I shared it right away and was like, please tell people. And I went home and I told my kids, you know, and, and they're like, we're good. Don't, and I said, I don't care if you're good. That's good that you're good. Tell everybody, yes. tell them. We got to watch out for what you're you might be considering to do right now and and i just think what a sad place that we're in that this is now the reality that we know that there's these toxic drugs out there and um we're losing all of these beautiful souls um and that it's it's hard because the supports are not there not only for the person facing the addiction but i think you spoke to it really well for the people around them who love them who don't know what to do yeah we didn't know what to do 
it was it was really hard. Yeah, well, and that doesn't come with the parenting um, list, you know. <laughs> it's, well, it's we're not. Sure, we're sure learning now. Um, yeah, I've learned a lot since since that. But yeah, unfortunately, I had to lose my son to get to this point. Yeah. So on April the fifteenth of of this year, uh, one of the MPs in my caucus, Don Davies, uh, tabled a bill in Ottawa. It's uh, Bill C two eight six. And this bill uh, would decriminalize personal possession. It would also expunge criminal records for possession, which I think is a whole other issue of, of discussion that we need to have around people who have a history, um, who now are being treated like criminals and can't move on with their lives even when they've sobered up. Um, and that becomes another high risk uh, act thing for them. And they may go back because they can't find work. They can't move forward. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm just, I find that one particularly frustrating. Yeah, relapses um, are highly possible. Yes, well, and continuing to treat this not like a health issue, but a criminal issue, which is really frustrating for me. It also ensures low barrier access to safe supply safe supply is important, it saves lives, yeah. uh, and it expands access to harm reduction treatment and recovery services. And I, I'm gonna say this again, because I think it's so important. When we speak about decriminalizing, we're talking about providing services to people who have an addiction that are focused on healthcare, focused on that, not making sure that we're decriminalizing so that drug dealers don't pay the price. Drug dealers are not part of this. We are talking about individuals with addiction. Um, so this is a health issue and addiction issue, and it needs to be treated as such. And our system does not, and other countries have. Portugal is an example that I think everybody should be looking at where they've done this and they've seen a huge amount of um, addressing stigma and people who are actually more likely to leave addiction because they have those resources waiting for them when they're at that space of being ready. So I'm just hoping you can share with me what your thoughts are on this bill. Well, I'm, I'm really, really happy that this is coming forward because we're finally being heard. Um, this, this does need to be recognized as a health issue and treated as such. And we can't keep incarcerating people. It doesn't work. People are not going to recover if they keep being put in the criminal justice system. Recovery is hard enough. People need support. They need compassion and understanding to get better. They also need to know that they matter and they're cared for. So what you're doing with Bill 286 is, is wonderful and I thank you very much. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I think it's important that it's on the record now and we start looking at the tools that we should have in our toolbox to support families and to support people facing addiction because it is this ongoing cycle. And I think a lot of people that are involved with the, the criminal system are probably very tired of this continuous. We're all tired. Same people. And it's like we want something different. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what do you want people, all the folks that are listening uh, and will watch this in the future to, to know the most about the work uh, that you are doing with Mom Stop the Harm? Well, um, I'm not so much political in Mom Stop the Harm as I am a helper. I give others support. Um, I care about what has happened to other families and we talk and share our stories, which is very important to all of us. I also help by doing awareness events and activities in hopes of reducing stigma and support for grieving families here in Pearl River and, and all over. That's good. Good. That's amazing. Well, and I, I, what I love about this program is it's, well, I'm a mom too. So I really, I know that moms will do whatever they can to make things better. And I really appreciate that all these moms have come together and found ways to make seen. That's what I notice about your work, Darlena. It's like, I think of the times when you have the crosses out uh, in the yards. It's yes. like people have to see it. They have to look at that and see it. And it's not just some somebody uh, that they don't know, or some drug addict that they have an opinion about. They have to see that those are all, all those lives, all those lives. 
Yes, and the, the Christmas tree that, that we started here in Powell River uh, is a really good one. And, and Mom Stop the Harm has followed in suit and putting those trees up all over Canada. So that's a white and purple Christmas tree with the faces of our loved ones who we've lost. Mm -hmm. Another it's, awareness tool. Well, and it, it is important. And I, I remember um, having a conversation with one of the firefighters in, in my riding. I won't say where, just to give a little bit of privacy. And um, he he said to me, what, what people don't understand is how many folks are dying are, you know, middle-aged, largely men who have a job in our community, nobody would ever think, and this is a recreational activity. And because fentanyl is in there, we are losing them. Yep. And it, so all of these stereotypes, it's not just people need to open their eyes. You know, these are not stereotypes. These are human beings who have yes. families who love them yep. desperately and would do anything to make that day never have happened. And that's why we need to see them. Yep, you bet. That's exactly right. We yeah. need to see them. All right. Well, Darlena, we're almost done. Um, thanks again for doing this. And I, I just, I want to say, I have one more, more light question, but before we go into that light question, I, I just want to recognize uh, again, the work that you do and just from one mother to another, just thank you because you lost a son and I can't imagine the pain of that, but the work that you do every day helps somebody else carry on. It helps somebody else not die though I mean it, it's so important the work that you're doing and that you've taken a very awful and painful thing that most people can't even begin to consider and you have built in his memory a lot of love and beauty so I just want to thank you for that and I know it will never repair that wound but you know you get to choose what you do with your pain and I think you've done something incredibly beautiful with it thank you that that means a lot so, and thank you for reminding me as a politician, I always say to people, don't worry about saying things a hundred times to me <laughs> because there's a million different issues. I care about so many of them and your voices really help me remember to stay focused on key things. And you are relentless. Every time I see you, you're like, here I am, Rachel, don't forget. Busy don't girl. Forget. <laughs> so I, I appreciate that. I never feel bad about it. So thank you for that, because that is that that work. And I often say to people, if you want to change something, you have to be fearless and you have to do it again and again. And that can be exhausting. Um, but there is an amazing elder, uh, Alberta Billy, who always says to me, we do it because we must. And I remember that. So when it's hard, I just remember we do it because we must. And I'm so grateful to her. Yeah. So the last question, a little more light and fun, uh, and to remind us all that we are human beings, I'm going to ask you three quick questions. The first one is, what is your favorite beverage? Well, it might be a little boring, but it's water. <laughs> I love my, my crisp, clean, refreshing water. Makes me hydrated and makes me feel good. Perfect. That's totally okay. Mine is tea, which is why you have some yeah. help coming to I visit have my you. tea. I have tea. <laughs> I have mine too. Tea. <laughs> tea time with Rachel. We have tea. Yes. Um, can you tell me what one of your favorite books or movies is? Well, uh, a book that I really enjoyed reading was called High Achiever. Mm -hmm. And that was written by Tiffany Jenkins. And Tiffany is an online blogger who's written as her personal story of addiction, going to jail and her recovery. Um, I found it really fascinating and I just couldn't put that book down. Yeah. That's awesome. I recommend that. I love this because I get all these great recommendations of books after it. So thank you for that one. That sounds like a really good one and uh, something that we all need to read a little bit more about. And the last question for you is, can you tell us why you love where you live? Well, Powell River. I was lucky to be born and raised in such a beautiful little town. I like that we're small and isolated. I feel relatively safe here, tucked away from the big cities. I'm an outdoors enthusiast and I, I love to go in the mountains for adventures and hiking, picking wild mushrooms, camping, or simply sitting at the beach and it's less than five minutes from my home. 
Um, Powell River boasts some of the most amazing sunsets and we are truly blessed to live in such a wondrous place. I really do love Powell River very much. Well, I'll be honest, I really miss it. Um, COVID has stopped my traveling. I'm so used to traveling all over this riding and it's a little bit hard, but it will get better, I know. But I love Powell River as well. And one of the things that I really love about Powell River is when I'm there, I'm always amazed by how many people come up and chit chat with me right away. And um, it's just such a friendly place and everybody knows who I am. And I, yeah. I really, really enjoy it. Um, and yeah, it's a beautiful place. I always tell people uh, in Ottawa that I represent the best riding and I really believe it. I think it's absolutely the most beautiful place. And I'm a small town person. I am not a big city girl. So I really appreciate it too. Well, that's it. I hope that was not too painful for you. I really no. appreciate you taking the time. I know you were uh, a little nervous, but I think you did an incredible job. And thank you for your bravery for coming here and sharing a story that touches your heart so much. Thank you so much. And, and I really want to thank you for asking me to speak to you today, because it, it is so important to me and the members of Mums Stop the Harm that that you talk about us and our health crisis in, in Ottawa. So I thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak out. Um, we're getting tired. We, we won't stop until we see change. So please help us so we can stop fighting and begin living again. I also want to say what an honor it is to have this conversation with you. I admire you, Rachel. So you're there, I'm gonna cry because you're such a strong and caring woman in leadership. I really admire you. I always, I also have you in my heart as a friend and I feel comfortable to talk to you. And I'm wearing your pin. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you again for listening and bringing this conversation forward. It means a lot. Well, thank you, because I feel that every time you share this story, you're sharing a sacred part of yourself, which is your precious baby boy. And um, so I really appreciate that. And thank you for those kind words. I'm surprised. I didn't expect that, but I, I really appreciate it. And I, I really uh, strongly appreciate how many people are working so hard to change this world. And it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. So thank you for continuing. And I know you're tired. I don't, I can't imagine how you wouldn't be. So thank you for keep pushing yourself even when you're exhausted and I will do my best to keep pushing as well. I love it. Thank you, Rachel. We're in it together. We are. We're in it together. Okay, everybody. Well, that's uh, it for today. I will see you uh, very soon. I'm not certain what we're doing next. I know there's a bit of a calendar, but I am so overwhelmed by our conversation today, Darlene, I can't remember. Uh, but we're doing these tea talks just to share the amazing people and the amazing work that's happening in the writing. So you will hear more very, very soon. Take care, everyone, and have a beautiful weekend. Bye. Thanks.